Look, before I jump into the honourable role of introducing our three panellists today, and arguably through the world's most interesting minds when it comes to emerging payments and open banking, I'm quickly going to set the scene. What started out in the UK and Europe in 2018, open banking has gained momentum across the globe in 2020, with over 70% of the top banks now having API platforms suitable to share consumer data. Europe and UK are starting to couple this now with real-time payment platforms, SEPA, Insta and Faster Payments, to create really seamless experiences without the need for a card or the scheme rails. In Australia, we went live with open banking in July with the roadmap that's already now looking to expand beyond banking data into the telcos and utilities. And the, in the US where it's industry led at present, we saw a record breaking M&A deal when it comes to open banking with Plaid being acquired by Visa back in January for $5.3 billion. Plaid did what the regulators mandated in UK and Australia, but within the fragmented banking system of US. And it was a strong signal by Visa to the rest of the sector that they too are very well aware of the tidal wave of disruption hitting the shores of traditional payment rails. Real-time payments between bank accounts is also quickly becoming ubiquitous with e-commerce and consumers, which has skyrocketed this year and we're starting to only now see some of the real innovation and rich customer and merchant experiences that this technology enables. I'm keen to delve into that today a little bit with you, uh, with the three of you. In 2019, 75% of digital users globally used a fintech application to initiate a uh, money movement. That's a 300% growth in adoption under four years, and we can expect that to rapidly accelerate in 2020 as a direct impact of COVID. Today, we're going to tap into the minds of three leaders at the forefront of this technology and driving the disruption of the money movement across the globe. I'm going to start with Brad. Brad Goodall, welcome. Startup guy, Australian born, dynamic and progressive figure in London's tech scene. He's rapidly become an authority in the new global movement when it comes to digital payments and open banking. Brad has worked with some of the biggest brands and names in technology and finance across Europe, US, Australia and Asia. His new venture as CEO of Banked, that's banked.com for those that are Googling at home, burst on the scene in 2020. Banked is at the forefront of driving a fundamental shift in payments away from that inefficient legacy infrastructure that results in really expensive and slow, clunky experiences into an instant, lean and real-time payment solution embedded in beautiful digital experiences both for the customer and the merchant or retailer and built on open banking tech. Welcome, Brad. Thanks, Sarah. Happy to be here. Awesome. Um, and thank you for getting up a little bit extra early for us. Uh, no Gareth, <laughs> Gareth Gumbly. Welcome, Gareth. Um, Gareth's on a quest to help people feel really good about money. Gareth has blended his track record of growing companies through strategy, business development and M&A, his extensive experience in running companies across financial services, payments, software, tech, telco and media sectors in Australia and UK, and that undeniable purpose to help people feel better about money into the leading open banking fintech in Australia, Frollo. Frollo is a purpose-driven fintech and the first licensed ADR that's um, accredited uh, data recipient to receive open banking. I got that right, I think. Um, to receive open banking data in Australia. Frollo offers both the end consumers an accessible app to help them with their money habits and powerful tech to enable businesses to build their own unique customer journeys. And working with EML for the first time, I'm really excited that we're um, in the process of creating a innovative and integrated white label payment and open banking solution one together. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you, Sarah. Happy to be here. Maybe slightly happier than Brad, maybe. <laughs> Great, that's good. Chris, um, it's high expectations now for your happiness. <laughs> and that brings me to you. Last but not least, Chris Rogers, a highly regarded tech leader who is recognised as a thought leader in emerging payments and specifically open banking. Recently, CEO of Split Payments, another trailblazing Aussie fintech, leading the way in innovative direct debit, real-time payment solutions and open banking tools. In 2019, he was recognised for success under his leadership, being awarded CEO Magazine's Startup Ex Executive in Australia of the Year. 
And earlier this month, Chris was able to share with us the news of his next chapter as Managing Director for the ANZ region for Mambu, a global leader in cloud-based core banking technology solutions. Excellent. Welcome all three of you. Great to have you here, Chris, too. A pleasure to be here, Sarah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Chris, we might start with you then. Um, you know, for the audience, there's a mix of um, people in the room here today that are um, joining us for email con. Um, and some of them are just as nerdy as, you know, us in the room here following open banking and in day-to-day -day, um, immersed in the emerging banking and uh, payment options. But for those that are, can you give us a bit of an elevator pitch on what open banking is? What does it mean? Yeah, gladly. I guess um, here in Australia, we call it the barbecue test um, to sort of explain what it is in layman's terms. But um, open banking is pretty simple, really. It's, it's using data and having access to data um, to deliver better financial or social outcomes. Um, that's nothing new. We can share data for a while now with our brokers to get a better mortgage. But the true innovation with open banking, this is near to real time so that things can be delivered instantaneously, customer onboarding can happen faster, insights can be delivered to customers in a real-time way in app on platform. So it's exciting that data is now driving a lot of payments decisions, but also financial well-being. And in the day and age we find ourselves, that's a pretty cool tool. Um, in Australia, banking is the first cab off the rank for a larger data reform called CDR. In some other countries where EMLR and where your audience are, it's either driven by regulatory framework or even just through customer expectations and consumer sentiment. So a real ideology of better outcomes for customers based on true insight analysis and, and data. Hopefully that makes sense to the audience in a, in a very simple form. Excellent. Yes. And we'll get further into, I guess, use cases and everything a little bit later on. Gareth, I mean, touching on that a little bit more, your team uh, led the way and were the first participants to receive data, which is a little bit like, you know, walking, the first man walking on the moon um, here in Australia with open banking. Uh, and that was in July. Can you give a little flavour of what we can start to expect? It's only just emerging now, but, you know, what are some of the product and growth opportunities that will emerge out of this new tech? Yeah, sure. And just, I mean, I guess I'll build a little bit on what Chris has said as well. But I mean, firstly, it's really the progressive thinkers now that are starting to engage with, you know, the consumer data, right? And in other other countries, we'll call that open banking. And Brad will talk to open finance in the UK when we start to talk about money movement as well. Um, and, and it's really about how do we um, best as an organisation, you know, for what Frollo is doing is how do we best hit that purpose you know, of, of financial well-being or financial goodness um, and providing the APIs out to our partners to be able to do that at scale. And, and so, you know, we're in a fortunate position to be able to leverage it from a consumer perspective, but also see these emerging uh, use cases coming through from our B2B partners. Um, they, they really, you know, at the moment really focus very much uh, in the um, streamlining of, of, of onboarding or verification of um, services and applications. So, you know, what we're really talk, looking at is where do we remove friction, you know, and I think we'll talk to that a bit today. Uh, and, and lending is probably a big thing because I guess ultimately we know that banking um, makes this money in lending and therefore um, can leverage this data in a more streamlined way. So for example, we can get uh, you know, 12 months worth of data from multiple bank accounts for customers, enrich it, you know, provide insights on that and deliver that to a consumer within 60 seconds, you know, update an, a transaction in a, in a retail store in a second. Um, so we're able to deliver these really um, quite beautiful experiences. And what we're seeing is you know, those uh, verification use cases are coming through as well, you know, somebody got money in their bank, can I take a deposit? That's going to save me money in my back office processing. There's a whole bunch of efficiencies that flow out of that that are really interesting. And I think that the most exciting thing is that we're not just talking about can we provide open banking or use CDR for banks, you know, and they, you know, give me a 360 degree view of my finances, which PFM apps have been doing for a long time. But more excitingly, that organisations that have strong customer bases that have some, in some way, touch consumer consumer data and financial data are now looking at ways that they can 
use those customer relationships to build a more meaningful and deeper relationship around people's financial services. And they have less to lose in financial well-being. The financial services industry can, in fact, you know, not always benefit from providing financial well-being. And I think that's what becomes interesting as we start to see, you know, organisations that are going, okay, well, how can I use open banking to make things a little bit better for me? Um, And then how can I tie all of those things together? Australia is quite unique that, you know, Chris mentioned that we've got telco and energy coming coming really quickly after banking, uh, and then we'll get right access and be able to move money too. So I think that's the, for me, that's the exciting thing is we're starting to be able to have conversations, not just within financial services, but well outside that, just using financial services as the data mechanism to deliver a better experience to a consumer. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I love that in sense that, you know, coming from the banking and finance world where we were obsessed with um, that main bank wallet and being able to, you know, see the whole of life. Um, I think you're, you touched on a really important point there, which is around yeah, the biggest players that can really stand to advantage out of creating beautiful experiences out of this aren't necessarily sitting in the financial and banking sector. They're actually sitting outside of that in the periphery industries that can start to create value out of this um, new source of data for consumers. Yeah, yeah. Now, a friend of mine sort of creates, a, uses the language of non-bank bank, um, which I think is a nice experience, you know, a nice phrase, you know, that we might we might be able to do that. And as our services become, our financial services become more aggregated, you know, we've got um, lots of different products that we're able to bring those together and build an experience, which is pretty cool. Just try saying that five times really fast on a Friday night. It probably won't go so well. <laughs> I like it. And, you know, building on that there, Brad, you're living and breathing the UK scene, which is a few years ahead of uh, Australia in open banking and uh, real-time payments. Can you give a view where you think the industry is heading when it comes to open banking over in UK and Europe? And, and then also, um, you know, can you touch on a little bit around what role you're thinking banked is going to play in that um, space? Yeah, I think um, open banking and, um, and open finance, uh, the, there's a real inflection point here in Europe and the UK. Um, and I think you're seeing in Australia is obviously, is, is obviously for, you know, coming, coming up alongside and behind that. Um, it, it's similar to the, to the inflection point you have with social media and mobile phone penetration. So social media really exploded when mobile phones became uh, ubiquitous. And, um, and I think it's very similar in the sense that You've got um, faster payments uh, or real-time payments here in the UK has been really embedded um, over the last five years, and it's certainly you know majority of customers would would have would have experienced a faster payment. Um, it's just as, as the norm now. Um, you've got banks investing heavily in API technology, um, not just because of compliance, but because of um, you know because of automation, because of cloud. You know, companies like um, Chris's new company at Mambu are uh, you know are, um, are, are, are starting to partner with banks to, to progress uh, their legacy infrastructure. And then you have compliance on top of that, forcing um, and in particular here in the UK, where compliance was um, partnered with with uh, the, the the CMA, the the Competitions and Markets Authority. You've got you've got compliance really trying to force competition. Um, and so I think. That has created this really interesting inflection point where things like connectivity to data, safe and secure consent, the movement of money over secure rails where you're not having to give your um, username and password to a third party, that, that is what is accelerating the pace of open banking and open finance here. Um, and I think, you know, I think it is fair to say that the UK and Europe uh, leads the way. Um, uh, I think you know certainly leads the way above places like America, and, and I think it's probably a few years in front of Australia, just in terms of the way that we've experienced digital banks over here. Um, and so, with that in mind, what you end what you end up with is to, to, to the discussion points before just more players getting in the mix. Um, you know, Plaid. You mentioned Plaid at the start. What, what Plaid did in the US was go in and do some real grunt work to try and connect up to banks almost in a hacked way. Um, it wasn't compliance led at all. And then when they'd done that across 10,000 banks, there was just no one that was going to go on that journey. So they became the only one. 
Um, that doesn't really exist here in the Europe and the UK because you can go and get regulated. You know, Bank, the, the, the company that I founded, has, is a regulated business. And so we can connect up to the banks um, and we, we work with the banks to get the best experiences and the best, um, you know, the best, uh, the most secure uh, experiences. And so that's very different to, you know, what we might have seen in the past with PFM apps where, it was very much screen scraping and kind of old, old, old school, sort of probably what you would consider not secure. Um, so I think with all of those things wrapped in, you just have this really interesting place um, where uh, the open part of open banking is able to securely accelerate, um, uh, you know, here. And, and to your point about, you know, banks, so, you know, what we, we just see that bluntly what we want to do is we want to bring everybody to the moment in time when a customer is making a decision to pay. And so we want to offer banks the opportunity to offer, you know, whether that's informed decision making, whether that's sensible credit, um, you know, uh, you know, affordable credit um, solutions. Uh, we want to be able to lower fees um, because, you know, not writing clunky legacy technology that that um, that we've sort of been used to in the past has then afforded this more efficient um, fee and um, and uh, real time connection model. Uh, and so it, what we get obsessed about is that moment in time when a customer is topping up a wallet, making a payment over e-commerce, um, you know, deciding to do something with their money. And I think combining that with the ability to, 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 to include open banking, you know, just creates an entirely new model um, to the way in which we move money uh, yeah, today. And it's going to be really exciting to see how that shapes up over the next couple of years, you know, with the schemes as well, because they've had the um, the duopoly or the oligopoly in um, the world today uh, when it comes to enabling those real-time type of payments. Now you've got that rich value that you can offer through that. I think what's really great about today too is that all three of you are coming from it from different angles, so I'm keen to tease out some of that a little bit more. Um, if we can get into maybe some use cases just to make it a little bit more real, you know, what's happening, you know, how does it shape up really? Particularly when we're looking at, you know, some of the guys in the audience that aren't necessarily, again, sitting in that finance or banking um, industry. Gareth, if we may, can we start with um, yourself, you know, around the, the rich data and artificial intelligence, where are banks, and I'm going to use your um, friend's expression, non-banks, uh, already starting to see the power of this data and when it comes to moving money and making financial decisions. Yeah, I think, well, I think the game changer for us um, in all of this is sort of getting to this language that we use, which, you know, around self-driving finance. You know, the ability to be able to use the data to make sure that my money is in the right place at the right time. So a lot of the clients in the in the audience, you know, for EML will be used to, you know, purse of money. You know, this is a prepaid card. This is a, a digital wallet of money um, where money has been deposited here for a purpose. And, you know, when we start to get into open banking, we're, we're starting to see more data from different sources, you know, so a more broad picture of a, of a, um, a customer's um, well-being or um, financial picture, we're able to start to move money to be in the right place at the right time to be able to deal with whatever the, the product experience is that sits behind that. So for us, that becomes important and why we're excited about, you know, kind of this, you know, uh, platform of being here today is that, you know, with EML's capability, we're able to move money around as well as not just see money and deliver the insight to somebody. So we can start to see that, you know, that they're short on um, short on funds, um, in this area, so we're going to we're going to top it up. We can see that their um, their velocity of spend this month is just they're a bit keen, bit eager, uh, maybe you know hit hit things just a bit too hard, and then we can start to slow them down with the control features of email. We're obviously able to you know start to warn them that they're getting close to their limits. We'll start to um, stop control and control around category or merchant or um, or product, for example. So I think that starts to get really exciting as we start to bring all that together, and then ultimately I think we can start to deliver these you know financial wellbeing experiences where you know um prepaid cards in some form are pockets and pots of money um so we've got the ability to start to control how we spend those those finances and i think that's um that's some of the big work that we do in our um our ai platform is categorizing each component of spend and making sure we're allocating that to the right place for the right experience for a consumer um and sort of starting to see that data and that some of those are risk 
um, examples, you know, that Brad spoke to, which is, you know, affordable and responsible lending, making sure that we're providing the consumer the right experience to know, okay, well, have I got enough money um, and my assets in the right position, my cash flow in the right position to be able to um, take on this debt and be able to manage and service this debt appropriately. And then the lender's seeing the same view, right? So they're seeing, you know, real-time data. We're not trying to interpret a, a bank statement. You know, we're using data to be able to bring that together and provide a whole bunch of analytics that sit around that that are kind of risk flags um, for the for the lender as well as um, risk flags for the consumer that um, with their future self may not be in a good position if they keep, you know, behaving in that way. Um, so they may not get the mortgage that they require in the future. And we can start to, you know, bring um, financial literacy into the into the conversation using data without um, trying to get somebody to go read a blog, which is just, you know, not going to happen, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, there's some of the things that, you know, that, that we see is exciting. And, and, the, and they're the, you know, some of the use case, you know, I guess more specific use cases for us is when it gets, you know, to the... Um, the perspective the brand has where you can start to bring money movement and money control in as well as just the insights of the data that we've got. Yeah, and that's really interesting, right, because, you know, it's almost taking what we do so well in business, which is forecasting cash flow models, and we spend most of our time in business in quarterly planning cycles around that and bringing that into the consumer piece. I think, you know, that the part that you touched on around that on financial literacy It'll be just really interesting to see what this means for the future generations where we know that the the financial literacy has been quite poor even in these really developed countries that we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, it diminishes year on year. I think that's that's clear. But I think, you know, there's little things that we used to, you know, you talked about financial literacy or just the, you know, the money model, which was, it used to be a, a sandwich box that you had or a tin, you know, which is where you kept your cash. Then it was, I go to the ATM and I press what's my balance. And then now, you know, we open our app. And so it's about building on all of that. And we can build much, much better experiences um, for consumers you know, using that data now rather than just what's the balance, you know, we can start to bring in well, what's happened and what's going to happen um, to, you know, help guide the future self. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And I mean, you know, building on that there, you know, given that UK and Europe are again, a little bit further along than Australia, we often look to that market from the Australian market as, you know, that future ball, the future crystal ball, I guess, of what's going to be, um, what's going to look like in the future. With the power of marrying those real-time and open banking data and a little bit more, and they're, they're already starting to do that, I guess, in Europe, UK, I'm keen to hear from you, Chris, in terms of, you know, what are some of the value props or um, value creation pools that you think are going to emerge, you know, as that next wave? It's almost in that incubation stage at the moment. But yeah. what do you see coming? Look, I think, um, I mean, firstly, and, and readily concur with um, the points Gareth made and Brad made about the application of it, deep diving into data. But what I've been really interested in is the immediate decision-making capability that data lends to payments. So when you start to marry the two, you've got real-time payments, it's money moving faster, but then you've got data to underwrite it with consent frameworks, permissions, authorities, security, but also a real-time picture. Um, what does that create? Um, it creates sort of an extension of the EML stable like control pay where we can avoid what I call the unhappy path, right? So if we're in a collections environment and you're trying to pull a payment, if you have the read-write capability, before you try and do that, the ability to look in and do a balance check so that you know the payment will be good when and if it clears, Mm -hmm. that avoids a headache that many payments channels have presented in, in the recent past, not just bank account transfer, but even card not present, insufficient fund declines, all of, all of those kind of things. So open banking is providing this immediate decision-making capability that benefits the consumer and a business as well in making collections better. So funnily enough, it's open banking has led to ethical collections as well. So you say to someone who's in debt, you know, they didn't pay their utility bill. Look, we're not going to do that weekly debit from you. We're just going to let you decide a minimum balance where you're comfortable for us to re- to take repayments. And using that data insight on connectivity, there's a fair income way in which you can monitor account balance and do fair collections. So that's a pretty cool user case. Um, but look, I'll go back to what Brad said about security and authority. All these new frameworks and with EMLs partnering, partnering with, with Frollo, we're just giving a level of confidence that the banks have had for generations. I trust the banks to hold my money. 
But then consumers are increasingly now operating in ecosystems, on platforms, in apps, and they deserve and need the same level of confidence in security. So a really important point to make that surrounding all of these great new bells and whistles has to be a framework that's trusted because we are, after all, in financial services. Mm, absolutely. And then I guess, you know, um, probably taking a step back from the trust piece, I guess, um, over in the, the UK, you know, the, the white elephant in this room at the moment in, in that space there, and I think it's on every business's minds and certainly becoming uh, more evident on um, expats um, in, in the European market over there, Brexit. It's, you know, um, keen to hear, Brad, you know, what does that mean? Like, are we taking a step back here in connectivity across or interoperability across Europe and UK? And what can we expect that to mean for open banking and real-time payments in the near future? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, uh, um, I'm not sure I would just be running the company I'm running if I knew the answer to Brexit. Um, uh, but but I think, I think, so there's two there's two things. What one is that the regulators talk very well together. The FCA um, has a very good relationship with a lot of regulators all around the world, not just Europe. Um, uh, you you have a scenario where um, cross border payments still exist today. So you still have to have like you know we, we have the pound and then you have the euro, and so there's still a cross border framework there. Those banks have never been entirely joined up to make that frictionless. So it's not like we're going to lose something as a result of this. I think the interesting piece is more how does the UK continue to keep the total addressable market that it's had um, for fintechs uh, and for this competition that's trying to introduce with open banking. That's the thing that I'm the most interested in. There's some, um, you know, there's a little bit of this, which is, you know, it, it very much depends. It depends on what some of the legislation is. So passporting exists today where, you know, for example, we're regulated in the UK. We were regulated by the FCA, but we've passported that regulation across Europe to the, to the member states in, of the EU. Um, it's most likely, and we have a post-Brexit you know, planning in place at the moment, that we'll have to have a hub in Europe um, to do business in Europe and then to, to, to get on board with those banks across there. Um, the, the thing that I think is clear is that the UK led went earlier than the legislation that was in, that was put in place. And the legislation was EU-wide. It was set into law before Brexit happened, so that's not going anywhere. But the UK gripped it and went, went quickly with it. I think, actually, Europe is still catching up. It's not anywhere near as fast as, as the UK is. And so, to a certain degree, we get welcomed in in some of the conversations that I've had with, with banks in Europe about just learnings that they're picking up from the UK. So... Uh, I don't have a I don't have a specific answer that says it'll be this or it'll be that, but I do think it's going to be. I think you've got a lot of people that are really looking at this to try and understand. You know, we were based in the or we are based in the UK and we get this total addressable market that's as wide as say the US. How do we keep putting in place the practices and the the, the rhythms and rituals and the networks and relationships to keep that? Um, because that's mm. it's, it's important for for a technology company. It's important for a um, you know for a business that's playing in this space. I think, Brad, uh, Brad, you make a really good point there about the passporting. And I think that's one thing that we can sort of look to is that increasingly we're seeing the regulators and, and governments, you know, start to work more closely together, particularly in the area of fintech in the space that we play in and, you know, in the ability to be able to take legislation, which is similar from market to market and, and actually provide frameworks to help us navigate the gap between, OK, so if I want to go from Australia to the UK, I want to go from Australia to Spain, what does that mean? What does that look like? And then providing us the framework to help us get there. I think is is something that we didn't used to have when I was working in payments twenty years ago. That that just didn't happen. Where right? you had to figure it out market by market by market. And I think you know that is that is allowing us to be more open and to look to use cases in more forward markets. You know, UK is a good example. And then be able to say to yourself, okay, I really like that. That is a use case that will work for me in my market. How do I how do I bring that here? Is it possible? You don't need to just look at the the regulation. You can start to say, okay, well, I could be one of those pioneers that starts to make this happen. I just need to start to work with the right technology partners that are already competing in some of these forward thinking markets to bring to bring that capability to my market. Mm. Absolutely. And do you see that you know as being um, you know, a, a short or medium-term type of horizon in terms of that 
I think what you touched on, which is interoperability between regions, Gareth, like, do you see that being something that will quickly grow traction or do you think it's going to be a longer burn? Oh, it's, it's a longer burn. I mean, all of this is complex. You know, it's, it's very complex as the UK has experienced and is already now going back to review its rules and, you know, we'll start to apply the similar um the, I guess the lessons that Australia realised, you know, before as they defined their rules, you know, that we're, you know, we're doing data and in, um, in uh, telco and energy, and now the UK will be doing the same thing. You know, they'll go back to that, and so I think, you know, you really got to have a five, ten year horizon to be able to say that we're going to have all of these things working together at scale. But um, it will certainly happen quicker than we expect. And I'd add to that, um, I recently did some work with the Emerging Payments Association in Asia. Um, which is a chapter of a UK association um, with SWIFT and PayPal. And it was ostensibly for APEC to look at interoperability between open banking frameworks and what kind of standardization you can achieve between them. And that was presented to the Business Council. So there's definitely an appetite to, to fast track that. But Gareth, you're right, nothing moves um, you know, as quickly as we'd want to in a fintech world when you're applying it to governments, countries. But with 61 RTP schemes across the world, domestic RTP schemes, I think there's going to be some significant change, and that's genuinely exciting. But um, we just have to continue to drive it by example and, and data and success stories. I think the good thing, the good thing has been that there's been this momentum that's built up, and so what you've got now is you've got a lot of independent companies, um, you know competing in the space. And so I think legislation kicked it off. Certainly legislation kicked it off here. I know you know legislation kicked it off in Australia. But I but I do think that that ultimately it will get to the acceleration will happen when it gets commercial. When it when it really comes down to companies that are able to get a really clear use case and, and do a little bit of what Plaid have done. You know, Plaid Plaid defined their own standard in the US and they they became very, very competitive in that space and they created great use cases and they grew and grew. And I think I think as you start to see some of these use cases really come to life, I don't think any consumer, I mean, I sort of hope I live in a world where consumers don't have to know what open banking is, they just have to experience it. Um, But I think as you start to see some of that stuff um, really come to the surface, I think towards the end of next year and certainly exploding out in 2022 in multiple regions and players playing in multiple regions, um, I think you're going to see commercial start to take over things like the standards and well, but this standard is, the, is this infrastructure is providing the best standard. And so now all of a sudden we're starting to see better use cases come from that infrastructure player. I think that's the thing that's that, that's going to really accelerate above and beyond, you know, compliance sort of dictating that this is a standard that, that you know, that people need to follow. Brad, if I had a mic, I'd drop it on your behalf right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a shame that um, that it has to be led by regulatory or compliance requirements in some regions um, to begin with. But you're right, you know, at the ultimate maturity of what we're trying to achieve from an objective point of view around that um, is where the compliance almost fades away into the background and we start to see it take its own life um, in innovation. Um, speaking of which, at email recently, we shared um, a strategic shift into becoming more of a true global payments platform, offering clients feature-rich value via a single integration. Um, a big part of that is our email FinLabs, uh, which is our VC arm of the business, where we invest and partner with best-of-breed fintechs uh, like Frollo, like Banked, to, br- to bring new and exciting products to our clients which many are coining this, you know, banking as a service, um, you know, in terms of what those features, um, you know, all complement to mean. Now, the winners of this emerging subsector will be those, you know, banks and, and, and also the non-banks who can play in the fintech ecosystem in nimble fashion. Would you agree, Chris, and, and a quick question on that there, why would a bank or a neobank look to a third-party provider to, you know, solve for some of that that you traditionally say is core value to the proposition of a bank or a um, financial mm. service business. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We, we all live and breathe fintech because that's who we are in this virtual room. And with fintech, unfortunately, comes many a buzzword that are overused, ad nauseum, they begin to mean less. So we have everything as a service from banking, from fintech, from payments. But what does that mean? If you think about one of the most used terms, ecosystems. Why are ecosystems becoming something of interest? 
in banking terms, it's very nascent still. But ecosystems are, and Mambu is very good at this, they focus on the core, core banking only, but they build an ecosystem of partnerships to use your word, Sarah, best in breed. Why is this important? Well, it becomes composable. So we want to build components that serve a customer in the most creative, agile, fast way to win market share if we've got our business hats on. So I'm genuinely excited about banking as a service and believe different best in breed can own different parts of it, right? Um, so we have to do away with the buzzwords and think about what does it deliver. And FinLabs will deliver it in spades, right? So you think, look, EML are great at these things and become market leaders in it. But we need a Frollo. We need a bank. And I think that's a really healthy way. But we need to educate banks and traditional financial services to think more like that. I could go deeper, but but that's in the simplest terms is let's just think outside a box and not be stuck in it. Like one vendor, one solution, one monolithic or even modular. That's so last year. Let's let's do away with that and get creative and build out of Lego, you know, that kind of structure. If I if I break it if I break it down one layer below, I I, mean, so I was involved in core banking for a bit before, before in fact for most of my career before um for payments. Um in the past the the way to access banking services was to go to a branch and you knew the branch manager and you, you know, and they knew kids and they knew, it, and so they were able to serve, serve things up. And then we started to branch out a little bit more and we got brokers involved and things like that. And, and basically what happened was when mobile as a channel stopped being a channel and started becoming like a proper business case um, and a business, um, business model, like mobile stopped being a channel and started being a business model, what you had was a bunch of fintechs that said, hey, we'll distribute your products for you. Um, and, and they went around to the banks and they said, well, what products have you got? And the banks went, well, we're sort of stuck because we keep everything in and we like this model and you know, mobile's a channel for us and we push our own products through our own channel. And so open banking comes along and it pushes the needle a little bit more and it says, well, you know, there's a way we're going to force you in some cases with regulation Everyone's investing in clouds. So they start realizing that actually, do you know what? I don't have to just be manufacturing and distributing everything. I could just manufacture or I could go and talk to all these fintechs and say, hey, I want to work with you. I want you to distribute the product I have, whether it's a lending product or savings product or whatever. And I think what it is is what you're seeing, and I'm not saying it's not a place for physical branches, but you're seeing a new business model take take you know um, place, which is to really get a, the, the kind of cost income ratio down for banks they have to come up with a new business model of manufacturing distribution and they have to find distribution partners. And luckily, we've got great mobile phone penetration around the globe. Um, we have a huge number of fintechs that are eager to find monetization strategies and desperate to kind of get access to customers. And so things like FinLabs from, from EML is essentially coming at the time when I think you know banks are saying, we're ready to work with you. You know, lending companies, credit companies are saying we're ready to work with you, fintechs, and what we need to see is that you can scale and that you've got the right, you know, funding and, and things like that. And so I think that's, you know, that's it's just this big inflection point now that is that is really taking shape. It's taking shape here in the, in the Europe and the UK. I see it taking shape in, you know, in Australia, places like Singapore. And I think it won't be too far before you start to even see America, which is considered to be on 35-year-old legacy technology as a country, you know, start to pick some of this stuff up as well. And that's really interesting, right, because that's a seismic shift in the mindset of banks from, you know, even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago when, you know, core to protecting that market share was holding everything within um, so I can't wait to see, I guess, you know, when you combine the powers of, you know, the banks and, and, the, and the balance sheets of the banks um, with the fintechs that have the innovation and see, you know, what great um, and cool things come out of it for consumers and businesses alike. Look, I feel like we could settle in for a much longer conversation. I could, we could all go pour a, um, a scotch or a wine and sit back and um, spend a good couple of hours delving into your disrupt, disruptive minds. Have, we're going to have to wrap it up in a few minutes. Before we do, can you indulge me? We're going to create a bit of a virtual time capsule here. Let's fast forward five years. What does the future hold in emerging payments and open, open, um, open banking? Sorry, what does the what does the future hold in emerging payments and open banking data ecosystems? Chris, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go to the um, the other two. 
Gosh, I felt well prepared for this, but that was a curveball. Thank you, Sarah. I think it's hard to predict in three years what a bank is, what is Bank X, and it's not going to look like what it does today. So um, I resonate with what Brad was saying at, um, in one point, that a consumer doesn't care for what it is. It's what it delivers and how it's delivered. So I think that it's inevitable that we're going to get what I call platformication, where everything is served through a platform through which I choose. And there's some radical thinking about that could be a... a, 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 a a, a virtual reality world in a gaming environment. So some really interesting forward thinking, but it's in situ and it has to be absolutely seamless. I know that's a bit of a cop out, but um, things are changing. You use the word radical, Sarah. It's it's just seismic. There's never been such a flux and change in banking. This is generational change. And it's being forced upon them by us because we're getting a little smarter. So I think we have to be forward thinking and, and architect in that way. Excellent. Gareth, can you beat that? No, I was hoping you'd go to Brad, actually, give me a bit more time. But um, for my, uh, I think where, I mean, one of the things, the observation I'd make is that, you know, in Australia, we have this, you know, this unicorn afterpay, you know, there's there's shifting the way that we we purchase. And, and that's really, so they're undoing and unbundling credit cards, right? And we're, you know, moving to an instalment pay, an instalment model that's kicking in and then, you know, spreading around the world. So we know, we know that's a thing. So I think in five years time to, you know, Chris's point, I think what we'll see is a, is a shift in product creation, you know, so products, Today, you know, uh, Brad also talked about this in terms of the legacy technology, right? It was, there was the channels that they went to market with and then there were the products that they take to market. So I'm in charge of credit cards, I'm in charge of um, deposits and I'm in charge of lending and I'm in charge of mortgages. And that I think that is what we're going to see shift as we start to unbundle that financial product because what's going to happen is with the data that we have and we're able to see and, you know, both, you know, we're being, the, you know, government is driving competition which, you know, is kind of forcing it. But equally, you know, fintechs are driving the opportunity as well as just business is driving opportunities, right? That there is big margins there to be had. So if we can see that there's an, a marginal opportunity to unbundle a product, to create margin and give more back to the consumer and deliver a better experience at the same time, you know, things are going to start to move really quickly. I think we're still probably you know, three years away from beginning to see scale in the use cases that we've been talking to and Brad's been, you know, all of us have been talking about. So in, in five years' time, I'd, I'd hope to see um, unbundling of products, better outcomes for consumers, um, you know, movement of money more regularly and more seamlessly to be in the right place at the right time, um, you know, and and ultimately, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna land on my purpose behind this. But you know, if people are less stressed about money because we've been able to bring technology in to be able to you know fix the mental models for that and deliver better outcomes, then I'm gonna be pretty happy. So um, that's what gets me up every day to have another crack at it. That's awesome. That would get me up too. Yeah. Uh, le- lastly, but not least, Brad, what's your predictions on top yeah. of all that? Yeah, I think it's really just additive to to, to what um, to what Chris and Gareth have said. I mean, I think um, you know we've been obsessed with this thing with payments for a long time, which is about removing friction. Like, how do we get this to be so seamless that you just walk up and there's a brainwave, and all of a sudden you've checked out? Um, and that's not often that that doesn't work in every scenario. That doesn't work for me if I'm trying to pay two thousand pounds for a TV and I'm trying to work out like, do I have enough money to pay it? Is it is the best rate? Is my bank giving me the best rate or is another bank gonna give me a better rate? Should I put it on a credit card? And I think the checkout um, is, uh, is, is the place that gets innovated there. And I think the opportunity is where, I think in five years time, where you can choose to seamlessly spread payments with your own bank, seamlessly spread payments with another bank that's not your existing bank, um, open a savings account really seamlessly because you booked a holiday 12 months in advance and, you know, no, I need to go on a savings journey. Um, so, so those types of things are where I think, you know, we, we, we are the, the direction of travel that we're headed in. I think, you know, the guys have talked about some of the wellness things, you know, putting, putting things in place that, that sort of give you the right symbol signs to say, you know, you're, in, you're heading into the wrong territory or, or, or here's a better way to make a more informed decision. Um, but I do think that, you know, this obsession with friction was good because I think it got us into a place where we could kind of speed up or we could kind of merge digital and physical together, which I think has been helpful. 
But I think, you know, going further than that, um, and even things like refunds, you know, how do you get an instant refund so somebody can be immediately making another purchase decision? Like, how do you get those things? I think that's what you're going to start to really see accelerate over the next five years and, and, and see that payments are a lot more useful um, and money movement is more useful uh, than I just get it out of my account as soon as possible to get the transaction done and then I get to take my goods with me. I think there's more pre, post and even during, you know, decisions to be made. And I think getting help with that um, is is the job of anybody basically working inside of open banking and open finance, um, you know, getting that, that, you know, that's that job for you to do for the end consumer. Excellent. And I think that's, you know, all of you touched on a little bit of that element of, you know, walking away from these monolithic type of product-based businesses where consumers have had to navigate structurally how these businesses and banks have been set up in the past and into this, you know, more experience-based thing where that, you know, the, the friction is um, is completely dissolved, I guess. And, and that'll be really exciting to see some of the innovations that will come out of equally all your businesses. And I'll be looking to them really closely over the next couple of years um, before we get the band back together in five years. <laughs> to open the time capsule, of course, to see who's the winner. Um, look, a very big thank you for this stellar discussion um, and your openness in sharing, just not with me, but also with the email con uh, family today. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation. I thought we were going to actually have more of a lively debate because I had, you know, we had people from different angles, but um, it turns out um, you're all in that real mindset of, you know, creating a better um, future for consumers and businesses. And I think that's really exciting. And if that mindset can start to influence and infiltrate out into our um, into our businesses and into our networks, um, I think it's an exciting opportunity ahead. Um, best of luck, uh, Chris, with your new venture at Mambu. I'll be um, looking forward to staying very close to that. Um, Gareth, I look forward to sharing more detail around the exciting innovations that we're incubating at the moment in co-partnership. And equally also, um, Brad, I cannot wait for us to share um, more about our partnership too in the coming uh, weeks with our um, clients, partners and um, the broader um, groups. Um, very big thank you uh, and uh, look forward to working with you over the coming weeks, months, years ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Take Thanks care. Sarah. Take care. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. See you guys.